just a little bit about myself. Um, like I said, a uh, UX developer Mutual of Omaha. You guys should check us out. Uh, you should come work here. It's an incredible place. Where's my team at? Holler. Yeah, there they are. <laughs> um, so yeah, I live in Nebraska, which is home of the highly controversial license plate. <laughs> draft, draft. It didn't make the cut, I guess. Um, and so for any of you not coming from Nebraska, this is where most people think we live. And uh, this, is, this is where I'm at. I live in Lincoln, but I commute to Omaha. Um, and so a little bit about myself. I'm a former tech support, kind of gone rogue. Uh, learned how to program and uh, got tired of not being able to fix people's issues myself. And so um, I've had the opportunity to write in Ruby, Objective-C, Swift, JavaScript. And I, you know, I'm a woodworker. I love chicken farming. Where are my chicken owners at? That's right. That's right. The eggs are good. OK. So uh, you know, I'm uh, on the Webpack core team and also the Angular CLI core team. Um, Angular users, where are we? There you go. Angular 2 users? Yeah, look at that. Love it. Check out the CLI. It's going to be powered by Webpack. OK, so if anybody wants to find me, it's at the Lark Inn. Um, so you can check out all those links, and I'll post the slides later uh, on Twitter. And if you want to pull out your phones right now, like I did, and go ahead and tweet this, I'll give you like just a minute. <laughs> and I'm going to tweet the NEJS comp. There we go. OK. So let's talk about JavaScript modules. Uh, you kind of have an idea of what JavaScript modules are, but I want to talk about their qualities. So they don't pollute the global scope. And they're reusable, or we like them to be, uh, encapsulated. You know, how many times have you heard closures are iffy? Uh, and organized. And they're really convenient. I mean, we love that, especially node programmers. Uh, but how do we use them? Well, in the browser, we can use script tags, but they're not really modules, they're just globals. Um, but you can use require and imports. Yeah, well, but they all kind of have a little bit of different shape. So we have CommonJS, AMD. We have AMD plus CommonJS. And we have ES2015, and then if you add some types on it, it's TypeScript or Flow. <clears throat> so let's talk about making them work together for the browser, which none of those things are supported yet. Um, and every library is going to be different. Um, and it has its own needs. Uh, each of these modules have their own shape, um, expressing dependencies, and their own way of using them in the browser as well. So wouldn't it be nice if it just all worked together, if there was one utility, one, one tool that seamlessly integrated everything for your web application, so you didn't have to worry about this? Let's talk about Webpack. <laughs> All right, so Webpack is a module bundler, and it's not a task runner, and it's not a module loader. It is a module bundler. It treats every asset entire in your application as a dependency and a module. <clears throat> and as you can see there, it's not just JavaScript. It's CSS, it's JPGs, it's icons, it's images, it's HTML files, it's Haml, etc. And it's a static build tool. The result of running Webpack is what ends up on the browser. Not, it doesn't live in the runtime. But how? OK, so there's three ways that you can use it. Um, the most common that you guys might find across the web or boilerplates documentation is going to be as uh, webpack.config.js. Um, something interesting to note is that you'll probably never find a configuration that looks the same. And the reason why is because a config file for JavaScript is just an exported object. So JavaScript's expressiveness and um, you, know, you can write a configuration any way as long as you are returning an object with those properties that Webpack understands. You can also use the Webpack CLI um, in really basic or simple usages. You could pass one entry file and then the name of the output and with some you know, flags and you can get out uh, the same results. Or you can use the Node API. Where's our uh, Node.js Express users? Raise your hands, make some noise. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Hmm. OK. So you can use Webpack with, 
The same concept, <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna skip it. Same concept, you can just put an object as the first argument, require Webpack, and that's the compiler. All right, so I'm not gonna do any live coding, one, because I'm terrible at it, and two, because I don't think you're gonna take anything away from it. I wanna teach you the core concepts of Webpack. The number one thing that I've seen, whether it be through maintainer, through Twitter, or social media, anything, is that 90% of people use Webpack but have no idea how it works. And so the whole point is that I want you guys to understand and have the tools and knowledge so that you can go out and feel comfortable and confident to take what you see on the web, make it your own. Because the most beautiful part about Webpack is that it works in any stack, any environment. It makes no assumptions about your workflow or any framework. It's probably one of my favorite parts. So the first core concept is entry. And you're gonna notice that some of the properties for the Webpack config may be you know, general, generally related to the core concept, but it's not necessarily the exact term. But entry, so the concept of entry file in a application is probably the biggest paradigm shift for people. Um, traditionally, we've been so used to sticking a bunch of script tags in the browser, and the global scope is really concerned for the browser. In Webpack, it's more like Node, where you specify one entry point, which kicks off your entire application. And so I'll give just a, a kind of pseudo example. So we have a bootstrap code, just JavaScript, and it requires some other, or some other files. And then those libs might require something else. I mean, we all know with Node modules that you can have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And let's say that those libraries have some CSS as well, and their dependencies. That top of the dependency graph right there is the Webpack entry point. That's what you're gonna specify in your configuration. So how Webpack works is that it's going to start there and walk through the dependency graph and only pick up what your application is using. And so in short, the entry in Webpack tells Webpack what to load and it complements the output property, which you're gonna see here. So output is kind of the opposite, but it relies basic, you know, on, on the entry point. So using the same model that we have here, we can specify an output property, a path and a file name, and the result of all that code in your dependency graph is then bundled up into one file called a chunk in Webpack. And this chunk is output based upon the properties that we specify here. So in, these, in the easy example, we are just emitting or outputting a bundle.js which has all of the code you need and you can instantly run on your browser through a script tag. So we know entry now and we get output. It tells Webpack where and how to distribute your bundles or chunks or compilations. It works directly with the entry point, and these two things are the most uh, minimum requirement that you need to actually use Webpack. So this is where it kind of gets interesting. Okay. <laughs> so loaders. Um, loaders describe to Webpack how to treat files that aren't JavaScript. So if you want to see the forest for the trees, Webpack assumes every module in your application is JavaScript. It makes no other assumptions. Loaders tell Webpack how to treat these files and include them into your bundle. So for example, right here, I just have a couple loaders that are defined, and these are essentially basic transforms that take and transpile one format of a file into JavaScript, which always is the end result, so that Webpack can handle it inside of the bundle. So let's say, for example, some of those files that we listed there, the way that this works is that Webpack, you provide a loaders object um, with a test property, which is just a regex to say, hey, when I see that .ts file, perform this functionality. And so ts over there is just a node module called ts loader. And the same thing with Babel if you want to transpile ES6. Or if you want to take and use CSS, you can require CSS in your JavaScript, and Webpack is going to treat that as a script tag and insert it 
through your JavaScript bundle into the browser. Really great to put in the head tag because you're forcing that critical CSS rendering. All right, so there's a couple other properties that you can use because uh, let's say you want to ignore your node modules. You don't want Webpack to scan everything. And so there's uh, includes and excludes, which can increase and filter through all of the different dependencies that Webpack might find. And then one other thing about loaders I want to talk about is chaining. It's probably one of the, <laughs> the biggest confusions. So I don't know why Tobias, uh, he's the, the founder of Webpack, um, specified it this way. I'm sure we can ask him. But uh, loaders can be chained together to kind of transform multiple different file types. So let's say with less, uh, you want to use a .less file in your project. Well, you can specify multiple loaders so that it behaves the same as if you were to uh, use a CSS file. Um, and so to chain loaders, the order is always the first is at the end, and then the last is at the far left. So they do read from right to left instead of left to right. But in this example here, you can kind of see how the process works down below. We take a style.less file, and Webpack converts it to a .css and passes it to the CSS loader. And then to uh, kind of an, a, a JavaScript object in memory. And then what style loader does, it, its responsibility, like all loaders, is one purpose. And that is to create a JavaScript file that inserts a script tag into your browser. So essentially, you would never have to include a secondary script tag if you didn't want to. So we know entry, and we know output. And loaders tell Webpack how to interpret and translate files. They return compilations. They provide the, the bundle with the end game, which is all JavaScript. And then plugins. So the best way that I've ever heard describe plugins is that uh, plugins do everything else that a loader can't. But I really think it's important to teach you the anatomy. And so a plugin in Webpack is simply an ES5 class. You have um, a prototype uh, function called apply that needs to be on the plugin. And it allows you to inject yourself or inject functionality throughout the entire life cycle of Webpack's compilation. So a really simple example, um, and I think this comes right from core, uh, you can see here that we have an apply property on the prototype and then simple events that are passed in from the compiler. And so essentially what this is saying is when Webpack is finished or if it fails, just make a bell noise in the terminal. But now that you know that they're just ES5 classes, to implement a Webpack plugin into your configuration, you just simply pass a new reference or a new instance of that plugin into the plugins array. And there's a whole bunch of different plugins that you can choose from. Um, and it, some of the most, uh, you know, everything from being able to do code splitting, uh, lazy loading. Um, it's so fine grained that you could create a plugin for the parser. We use a, a parser at the lowest level powered by Acorn. So if you wanted to say, I want to totally make my Webpack build fail and melt if another developer tries to use eval in my entire code, melt. You can do that because it looks for an eval expression. <laughs> and now, here we go. So if you've ever looked at the Webpack source code, you might find out that, look at all these things called plugins. That's because Webpack itself is based on a 200-line mixin library called Tappable. And the entire compiler, everything around it, is 80% made up of the exact same plugin system that you use externally. So yeah, you could actually use any of the core plugins you wanted to as well, or use that as a basis point to create your own, which is just scratching the surface on the power of what Webpack can do. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <clears throat> so, we know what the entry can do. It 
it tells Webpack what to bundle. And the output tells it where and how and in what format. Loaders describe how Webpack should treat its dependencies. And plugins do everything else. Adds additional functionality to compilations, or bundles, or, or chunks. <clears throat> There's a lot of different terms. So I want to clear the air first. I want to have time for questions, but I sometimes ramble. And so I want to get some of these things out of the way right now. Why use Webpack when I have Grunt and Gulp? Well, Grunt and Gulp are a task runner. They don't know anything about deduplification, optimizing. It, it doesn't have any knowledge of a dependency graph. And so when you just grunt concatenate all of your files together into one, think of that, you know, even if you're only using two methods from moment and one from Lodash, what kind of overhead are you putting into your application by doing that and just concatenating? Webpack only uses what you ask for. So um, there's an excellent video that just came out uh, by Glenn Mattern. He's the author of CSS Modules, if anybody in the React community knows. Um, and he, I, I asked him, I said, can I please use this for my presentation? Because it, one, it looks awesome, and two, it's just so well described. So we are so used to Grunt and Gulp modern er, toolings that you know, every type of file would have its own different process that we would have to manage. And it's a nightmare. I mean, how many people here have over 500 line Grunt or Gulp files? I mean, I had, I had like every single one was for me. And this is why. Webpack, again, uses a dependency graph. So everything is related to each other. When one file relies on another, that is considered a dependency in Webpack. And that allows you to bundle it up together. So what's better, Webpack or System.js? I know you Angular folks hear this all the time. Well, they're completely different. They're not even the same thing. Webpack is a module bundler. It doesn't do anything at runtime except emulate a module environment for you. Whereas System.js is a dynamic module loader. That's something that Webpack does not do. And we're OK with that. However, you could compare System Bundler with JSPM to Webpack. It's a better comparison. HTTP2 will fix everything. We don't need a bundle, Sean. You know, we can take our existing app and just, you know, it's super fast. No. No. I mean, last time I checked, my last project had like 300 node modules. So if you think you're just going to serve all of that up, there's, it's not the answer. Bundling with HTTP2 is what drives progressive web apps and makes it super powerful. And on top of that, we have some stuff in store for HTTP2 with Webpack. So just really quick, you can compare the features. I know it's a little hard to read. Um, but take a look. I've highlighted where Webpack is. If you wanted to decide a bundler, which one seems like the right choice? just by the feature set. I know there's a lot of Browserify users out there, and this is what I always show them. <laughs> and this is just scratching the surface. There's so many more out-of-the-box features that I haven't even talked about with core concepts. There's a dev server that comes with it, hot module replacement. I'm sure you've heard that buzzword like a thousand times. Code splitting code sharing, um, you can lazy load code and modules and images and CSS. All of this are features that you can do with Webpack with little to extra configuration. So what's the future? You know, people have been like, JS fatigue. No, this is JS renaissance. Webpack 2 is bringing all sorts of awesome features, and it's here now today. It's in beta. The only reason why we're holding it back from beta is because we understand that our documentation is not the best. And we want first-time users who struggle with it the most to be able to walk away and say, I get it. It makes sense. Let's do this. And feel excited. Right now, that's not the case. And so that's our only blocker. So if you want to use Webpack 2 today, do it. It's stable. But it has ES 2015 module support. So you can do tree shaking. It's faster in builds. It's more optimizations built in, especially with its core loaders. Um, the loader syntax is easier. 
and you can use it right now. And there's other features. Take a look at the link. We have a, a kind of a, a what's new in Webpack doc that uh, has been pretty popular. So looking a little bit farther, you know, what are my ambitions for Webpack? Well, HTTP2, we just added aggressive splitting plugin. So uh, this is in latest. You can use it right now if you wanted to. But it allows you to split up large chunks of code into smaller mon or modules and bundles by specifying a min size, a max file size, and even the amount of modules you want to use. What's awesome about this is that we're going to leverage the power of HTTP2, which is multiplexing, and then use it with bundles, which are high performance. There's a dependency tree, and this, is, this isn't in a feature yet, but this is my hopes for it, is that with the HTTP2 spec, there is a push manifest that you can provide for your server for some. Well, what better tool than the freaking dependency graph bundler that you're using could describe what are the priorities of things that you need to use? So see or look for that to come. Usability, and this may not be immediate, but we get that the configuration is a struggle for people. There are leaky abstractions, and we own it. And that's why we have issues on GitHub for requests for proposals. Um, we want to be able to make it usable for anybody, whether it be in a terse fashion, or have an escape hatch, or a UI, or an interface, whatever caters to you. But we want to make it better, because it's not the best story right now. And then optimization. You know, there might be people out there like, oh, you should use Rollup. And I said, use Rollup. It's awesome. But it, it's just a feature. Webpack is the future. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Uh, dev tools. You know, we are working with multiple browser teams, Edge, Chrome, et cetera, to bring dev tools, custom instrumentation, and UIs for Webpack. These are the possibilities. And then these are kind of my crazy ideas, and people are like, Sean, slow down. Headless Chrome. You can get timeline statistics from their API. Why not integrate machine learning? Why not automatically tweak your bundles or your HTTP2 manifests? You can do all this stuff automatically. We can make these tools awesome for people so they don't have to worry about it anymore. And maybe we have a, a module spec that's driven by bundlers. Could modules describe how their dependencies are used so that anybody could use any type of bundler? I think so. It puts more responsibility on the package owner, but I think that that way you can use your bootstraps without having to shim, you know, a couple of things in all your bundling tools, et cetera. And we've got Marcy Sutton involved, uh, who's been really super awesome and willing to be able to help us brainstorm ideas on how can we make accessibility testing more awesome through Webpack. We have access to all of these assets and dependencies. Why can't we use accessibility? So in the future, look forward. Or if you have awesome ideas, bring them to us. But we see the possibility. And there's more. There's more. <laughs> that, that's Mike. <laughs> yeah, yeah. OK, so real quick, the state of the art. So who's already using Webpack? You may already be using Webpack, and you don't even know it. So if you're using the Angular CLI for Angular 2, and you've checked out some latest, Webpack is in there. And you can install it right there. Uh, create React app. Are there any React fans in here? Come on. Yeah, maybe. Have you guys tried Create React app? It's got Webpack powered underneath it. Dan Abramoff complains to me about it all the time. <laughs> uh, Laravel 5.3, any Laravel owners? Woo, yeah, Laravel. Webpack built in, out of the box. Grails, Ruby on Rails, there are drop-in replacements to Webpack that you can simply add to replace a not-so-ideal asset management system. And then JavaScript services, ASP, anybody? So ASP uh, Net Core has added JavaScript services which uses Webpack under the hood automatically. This has been the growth in one year's time, 400%. And it's because of you guys. Webpack is built by you, the contributors to modules, plugins, loaders. Um, it would be nothing without the support that you guys have provided, and the usage, and the bugs, and the issues, the complaints. We hear it all. And we give a shit. And we want you to complain to us. And you know, if your project manager or your, you know, doesn't understand why, you can tell them this. 
performance. Every 100 milliseconds adds 1% of conversion to your bottom line for your product. Do you think it's worth it? So if you want to get started, uh, there's a couple just quick websites. So Awesome Webpack. It's part of this uh, awesome list. Uh, they just created it. I love it. I think it's great. You guys can go to the repo. It has all of the learnings together because they've been a little bit scattered. And then Webpack from First Principles, so Glenn Mattern. You need to take a look at this video. If you've never looked at Webpack, this will clarify so many things. And it's in a great way, and Glenn has a really sexy voice. <laughs> and how can you help? So triage our GitHub issues. We love the help. If there's experts out there and we don't know about you, I want to know about you. Core loaders and plugins. We need maintainers on these under the Webpack organization. If you're interested, let me know. Put in an issue. Webpack slash webpack.io. This is our new docs that is basically holding up beta 2 release. We have a milestone um, list of issues that we need to complete. Help us do so. And use Webpack 2. Submit issues and you know, file bugs, reports, suggestions, comments. And then tweet at me. I love to tweet, and I maybe kind of have a tweeting problem, but um, tell me about this talk and, and how I can make it better. And then also, never feel afraid to complain about Webpack. It's the complaints and the concerns and the comments, the questions, the frustrations of not understanding that have powered us to make it better for the future. And we want it to be the future, even to the point that you may never have to worry about it or use it. So thank you. Thank you.